Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of Frontier Opening Bell. I am Boston Amofaye, and I'm happy to have all our panelists here on the show today. Ayode Jiebo, who is the CEO at Afrinvest Securities, Alec Ansaju, the CEO and founder at Rich Frontiers Management in Nairobi, Kenya, and of course, Uchenda Minis, the uh, managing partner at Blue FX Nigeria. And also connecting to the show is Luke Ofojebe, who is the head team in charge of equity research at Vetiva Capital. Thank God it's Friday, everyone. Let's take the show and let's get started. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Thank morning. you. Thank you. Let's take a look. Of course, it was a sea of red across major, uh, many African markets, uh, equities markets on Thursday in line with the rest of the global space. So you can see that on your TV screen, Nigeria was down 0.12%. The Ivorian market softens about three quarters of a percent. Egypt lost its uh, rally 1.35%, taking a bite of the rest of the emerging and frontier markets. Kenya was down 0.22%. South Africa was down about 1%. As we speak, the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, Patrick Njoroge, is doing a press briefing, which is a follow-up to yesterday's decision by the Monetary Policy Committee of the East African Economy to keep policy rates unchanged at 7%. Meantime, Rwanda's GDP slows to 3.6% in the first quarter against 8.4% previously. Meantime, Uganda uh, gets a Fitch outlook revision to negative on the downside risk to the country's public finance. Meantime, Mozambique foreign trade deficit stands at $908.3 million in first quarter. The biggest story Ali wants to talk about is the policy rates decision by Kenya's central bank and the press briefing ongoing by Unjeroge in Nairobi as we speak. Yes, so good morning, Basan, and good morning to everybody. Um, uh, unchanged interest rates, but we've had some very bold and ahead of the curve interest rate cuts until now. And I think what the central bank governor is signaling that he's in a wait and see mode to see how much of these rate cuts transmit into the real economy, given that we're in an environment where we've had a supply and a demand shock. What I found interesting was he was quite, quite bullish about uh, uh, the prospects he talked up horticulture, and he said horticulture is back to where it was at the start of the year, um, and overall painted quite a, a, a more rosy picture um, than uh, some of us might have thought. But I think he's also doing a little bit of the heavy lifting around lifting people's spirits as well. The consequence of these rate cuts is really seen in the massive oversubscription for government securities. So yesterday we had a T-bill auction. Uh, over, you know, we had we, he was offering four billion in the three month or the six month. He was he, he had bids of twenty billion. So really, what is, seems to me what's happened is demand for for credit has collapsed within the real economy and it's all going into uh, government security, something, a phenomena you've been seeing yourselves. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, he, he kind of said, you know, it, it looked better than a lot of people expected. NPLs at 13%, so 10 basis point improvement in the previous month. And overall, it seemed to be pretty happy with where he was at. Rwanda, you mentioned 3.6% uh, Q1, frankly, far better than I expected because they've had one of the most aggressive lockdowns of any country in Africa today. So that was interesting to me. Uganda's downgrade. This is in a sequence by a sort of downgrades we're going to continue to see across the continent. Fitch um, it basically stated the obvious. A lot of people feel that uh, ratings agencies tend to Pronounce after the horse has bolted, but essentially, I, I think you know this is something we all would have expected. Mozambique's interesting uh, that number, nearly a billion dollars in Q1. What's interesting with Mozambique is they're guaranteeing 2.25 billion dollars for the gas project. Their gas find off uh, the coast is 
as big as Qatar's is in Qatar. It's a, it's a monster uh, reserve. But the question is, a lot of people were asking was, will it be slowed down uh, given the current macro environment we're in? But I think Mozambique obviously is very keen for this not to be slowed down at all. It's a game changer for the economy in terms of size. They've had a few stop starts, but I think people are more bullish but we need to keep an eye on Mozambique because the current economics obviously aren't that bright. In, in, interesting uh, pan East African views you've given us. Thank you for that overarching uh, 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 position of um, some of the top stories within the East African space. Our EDG Ebro at uh, Afrinvest uh, is uh, looking at Nigeria's story. Uh, overnight, the Central Bank of Nigeria released uh, minutes of the of his last one day monetary policy meeting, uh, which uh, revealed some uh, stories around banks non performing loans and reclassification or re or rejigging of loans uh, uh, in the manufacturing sector. That is in the news. Meantime, Nigeria's PMI dipped to 41.1 in June, non manufacturing very uh, weak at 35.7, both of them below the uh, uh, healthy 50.0 reading. In the market, ICO Insurance is selling off 96% of its stake in ICO pensions to FCMB Pensions Limited. The company says this is no brainer and it will have no impact negatively on ICO Insurance. Meantime, another insurance company, NM Insurance, is raising its capital to $10 billion from $4.2 billion as the regulator in the Nigerian insurance sector extends the deadline for the sector of recapitalization until later in 2021. So let's take that on board. Then, uh, of course, the Code of Wars uh, story is also the IDG. Let's start with the banks. When uh, the central bank and loans around banks uh, hit the headlines, it makes a big splash. Okay, uh, thanks uh, for having me. Uh, the, I believe is one of the palliative measures that we saw about two or three months ago that uh, the CBN were enc um, encouraged banks to see how they want to restructure loans of the customers. And now, based on the statistics or data that has been provided, about 32,000 banks have applied to about 32,000 customers, which accounts for about 32% of the total loan in the manufacturing and trade sector. Uh, we believe that uh, while this may have short-term impact on the earnings of the banks, uh, but in terms of the reporting, the, we, we, we won't see a major spike that would send very negative signal to investors. Uh, the MPL was around, was, was around maybe 6 or 9% um, uh, as at March, and if uh, the CBN did not provide that, that um, option for banks to be able to provide moratorium, restructure loans, we could have spiked to as high as maybe 25, 30%. You can see with the PMI results, um, mm -hmm. PMI reports, we, we could still see that both the manufacturing PMI and non-manufacturing are still underwater. Uh, so as a result of that, we believe that this would have a very um, positive perception or outlook regarding the financial. So we're all expecting next month, we're all expecting H1 uh, financials half year result of most of the banks. We, we don't expect, because of this um, restructuring, we don't expect to see a major spike in payment charges, though uh, the top line would, all, would, would, would reduce as a result of uh, the moratorium that has been given, because a lot of the the customers would, would not would not have been able to pay their interest, and there will be no interest for the banks to book on the loan, which accounts for a major part of their earnings. Um, so um, you also spoke about the story of of ICO insurance divesting. Uh, if you look at uh, if you look at the books of ICO insurance, you discover that it contributes less than three percent to both their top line and bottom line. So we don't expect any major reaction from investors. Um, I believe it may just be a strategic decision of the management to focus 
on some of the other business. They still have uh, the health insurance. They have the asset management. Um, we are not sure if they are also trying to um, spin up that to focus only on their insurance, general life and non-life insurance. So, but I think by and large, um, we we don't expect any major reaction on on that. Okay, a quick one. Uh, why are you surprised that some of these loans that the banks uh, says the customers are trying to apply for a reclassification or rescheduling is coming from the manufacturing sector? We all thought it's going to come from the oil and gas services industry. Um, I'm surprised that it's only coming mostly from the manufacturing sector because if we hold, if you also look at the oil and gas sector, the upstream sector also suffered have suffered um, in terms of oil prices have declined and if you look at uh, the cost of production in nigeria is still very high so i believe that a lot of those companies too are still struggling uh, i'm surprised why most of them are also have not also applied or maybe they were not also included in this report so i i believe that um, they will also be affected you also want to look at the downstream sector. There's really, most of the companies, they are not, there's really no business activities there. You all just rely on NMPC bringing in the product. And, and so um, I believe that um, most of the um, the oil and gas companies too, especially the upstream guys too, have also applied for a restructuring within this period when, uh, especially the period when oil prices tanks low. Okay, quick one. Uh, um, thank you so much. I'm going to allow Luke Ofojebe to give us about one minute his thought about this new report. Okay, the, the, the minutes of the uh, Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank was released. Part of the comments of some of the, uh, of the Board of Governors of, of the Central Bank was that about uh, 17 banks uh, talk, were, were, says customers, about 32,000 uh, customers were looking to reclassify or rejig their loan portfolio. Uh, because of the pandemic and all of that. So what's your take on that story? I'm sure you know, you're aware of that story at Bativa Capital. Okay, yes, yes, very much. Thank you for the question. Um, so clearly, um, given the outlook for the economy, um, the base expectation is that for a number of banks, we'll be seeing like high rates of loan default um, due to the fact that a number of companies will actually be struggling during this period. So, for these um, companies, they might not be able to meet up with their debt obligations, and that's why we think um, a number of them are actually seeking the part of restructuring their loans. And I think um, that's going to be um, the trend for some time now. Uh, we'll see that happening a lot. And I think for the banks, it's also going to be a good one. Rather than having a loan being registered completely as a non-performing loan, you still want to preserve Um, of your bank assets. Um, so as a result of that, due to restructuring their loans. Um. Uh, Luke? Okay, I guess we lost uh, Luke there. Very quickly, let's, uh, I will get him back on to the, uh, on, on the connection. Uh, just a minute, let's quickly run through the Southern African markets and then bring in Uchina Minis to weigh in on what we're seeing at the moment around the global uh, market space. South African, uh, the GSE yesterday, of course, uh, fell, uh, fell uh, alongside other uh, emerging and frontier markets on the continent. The South Africa's producer inflation was up 1.2% according to economic data. Wholesales uh, data, 5.5% year on year in March. Meantime, in Namibia, Old Mucho says it's buying 5.2 shares of, of, of equities in, in shop right holdings. And uh, Satrex NDX notifies that it's listing 100,000 securities at about 98 rands uh, per unit. And the Anglo Gold, uh, Anglo American PLC, uh, publishes reports of its payments to government uh, in the year 2019. So, quick one when we go to the uh, global market space with uh, Uchena, where are we at the moment as we're wrapping up the week? It looks like crude oil is trying to climb back, uh, trying to hold on to $40 and not letting go. Yeah, um, crude oil, um, if we want to look around, uh, take a broad outlook on asset classes, um, crude oil is actually 
outperforming other risky assets if you want to look at it from a week on week basis. But generally, um, it's looking like um, we are having a recoupling of fundamentals to what market is sort of pricing. Um, we are seeing that bad news are sort of taking effect on prices of um, equity prices now. Um, yesterday, um, the bank released um, a stress tax result. The Federal Reserve did a stress tax result, sort of highlighting that the um, banks are in good shape, but also um, going with the caveat that they would um, prohibit them from buying their shares back. So they won't be share buybacks all through um, September. Uh, they will also not be allowed to um, pay out dividends to just that um, they are trying to preserve um, um, their capital base against a sudden shock. So in a way, um, it's looking like the Fed is also looking to pricing and, and control the risk of a possible second wave of coronavirus and is trying not to take chances in that regard. <coughs> and I think that in itself is starting to weigh into the market as people are trying, investors and market participants generally are sort of going a bit cautious in terms of um, jumping on, 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 on the asset classes, basically. Yes, you know, when I read the, the, the U.S. Fed board uh, statement late last night, uh, Uche and I said, look, okay, this looks like uh, Jerome Powell going to the back door and quickly shut the door uh, on the banks before they start uh, rewarding themselves and start uh, uh, playing some, some games, as it were, quote and quote, uh, while uh, through the front door they are getting support. Uh, from the fiscal authorities. So they quickly say, look, you can't do share repurchase, uh, you, you can't, the dividends you have to. Uh, so that stress test report actually caught my attention uh, late uh, yesterday evening from the US Fed. A very interesting uh, a scenario. Uh, they're at least trying to make sure everyone be behaves themselves and learning from the lessons of, uh, of 2009, 2010 global financial crisis. Ali. Yeah. Let's talk about yeah. Southern yeah. Africa. Both since, um, Quick one. Uh, Ali, give me a second. Let's uh, get uh, Uchena to finish up on this. Yeah, so so about that, there's something I just need to highlight. Um, it's very important that we should know that um, there is no central bank that would have the, um, um, should I say, moral ethics to come out and say we are in trouble and the banks are having issues now. They will never say that, right? They would always say things are okay and things are perfect until it's too late. So basically, most cues that the market can take are cues like this that are sort of subtle and not exactly direct, saying that, well, we don't want you to go aggressive in terms of your share back. We want you to still provide your capital base. Uh, also, put out the, the, the directive that they have to send out the, their capital structure towards the end of the year. And those were the things they were pushing out to banks that were stressed during the global financial crisis. Mm. So that in itself is showing that sort of red amber, um, red um, light, uh, um, red light a lot. Mm. Red light in a blue light district. Red light on Wall Street. <laughs> Ali, what's your take on that? Well, you have red light on blue strip <laughs> on a green back. What's going on? Uh, I, I think that's a very interesting point uh, that was being made, particularly around how a central bank is never going to tell you it's all gone to the dogs, God help us, right? It's never, those words are never going to be uttered by any sane central banker. But have a look at the share prices of all these banks and have a look at what's been happening not only in America but in Europe. These share prices are at multi-year lows. And there is a clear signal being emitted from the share prices of Western banking institutions. In part, it's because of the interest rate structure, because you've got this uh, very compressed low interest rate structure, which is, mm. is typically not good for the banks. But I think uh, what was being said is perfectly correct. We've got to keep an eye on that. I, for one, actually think that although they're denying the fact that they'd ever considered negative interest rates, if I look at bond yields all across uh, the US, if I look into the UK where five-year gilts went negative yesterday, if I look into Europe, I think, I'm afraid that within a few months we're going to have a negative interest rate structure across these developed markets. And I think that also is something we should be anticipating. 
Yes, because before the pandemic, the, the coronavirus, it was all about the unsustainable level of the global debt space. That's what the talk last year was all about, even as we started the new year, that there's a pressure, there's a bubble bubbling up at the global debt markets, at the bond markets. I think we still, that problem is still somewhere there now being compounded by the coronavirus and how we try to get out of it, even in frontier Africa where we're borrowing left, right, and center. So I um, energy. No central bank will ever tell you that all is not well. So when we look at the Nigerian scenario, that we're likely going to be kicked out of the MSCI frontier markets and become a standalone market uh, in terms of, 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 of index. What's your take on this? The pressure, what we're hearing is that foreign investors are getting pressure for the lack of foreign exchange, the illiquidity in our market space. Um, I think the unfortunate thing is we've gone this route before. Um, 2016 is just four years away, which we shouldn't um, forget so quickly. Uh, we were also, it was until we were isolated um, classified as a standalone, and a lot of foreign investors had to sell down uh, before we, be, um, we had to look for a solution. That solution was what gave confidence to foreign investors to come back in 2016, 2017. And now, um, when the central bank is trying to give a time to when they can supply, it means that the investors don't have control over their investment. That is the signal it sends. Um, investors will only try to invest in a country where they have the ability to, to exit at any time. Some of their, their companies may need cash over there. And I can't be telling, giving you an instruction that it's on to this period before you can take out your phone to solve your solution. So I believe that... Uh, it's beyond when the CBN would eventually supply them with these dollars. We may lose, it, it takes time to build confidence. We may not get a lot of these guys back, even when things are normal, because of the experience of their experience now. And it will take a lot of road shows, a lot of convincing, more efforts than what we would have done now. I'm not saying it may not be very easy for the CBN to supply everything now. But I believe that the delay is getting too long and against the will of the foreign investors as to when they need to exit. Um, a lot of them are being uh, persuaded now to roll over because of there's no dollars, roll over their OMO deals as well as um, reinvest their dividend in the equities market. But once some of them exit this market, it will take years before they um, they, um, they come back to our market. And other African countries are already positioning for these funds, trying to learn from some of the things we have done wrong from in Nigeria to ensure that they attract a lot of these funds to their own country. Don't leave your, la don't leave your lunch unattended. Someone else is going to steal your lunch. That's what it means. Don't leave your lunch unattended. Someone else is going to pick it. So, Ali... Uh, give us a minute of the Southern African market so far this week. So, I mean, you know, we've seen the RAND uh, come off those very elevated levels, which aren't really elevated if you think back 12 months, which was with the 16 handle. We've, we're around 1720, 1725. I think part of the reason was that late rebound in Wall Street, which made people feel a bit more. Um, risk, risk on early in the morning, bought some rand, and uh, I, I think that spilled over into the South African markets. But the key event in South Africa was really the budget. The numbers are really uh, eye-popping in terms of what we're seeing. And the question is, you know, how will international investors take that going forward? I, for one, think South Africa is a little bit overcooked now. I would be defensive on the rand. And, uh, uh, and a little bit cautious. Stock market, I think, is okay. Particularly if the rand sells off, people like to buy up the precious metal stocks because of the FX arbitrage. You also touched very briefly on ShopRite. ShopRite is an interesting business. 
hasn't done very well in Nairobi. They're actually kind of uh, 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 pulling in their horns. But that was the announcement uh, in Namibia where the uh, insurance company was taking a stake. And this speaks to the sophistication of the South African corporate sector. You know, I saw some data out of UNCTAD saying that they are, and they still are the biggest investors on the continent, whether it's Standard Bank, whether it's, and they, they work in conjunction. It's quite a mature way of going about things. And I think that, that was my takeaway about uh, that particular transaction. But overall, look, South Africa very tied into the global economy. A lot will depend on how the global economy does now. And I, for one, think that the IMF were the ones I'm looking at. They were a little bit more skeptical about the rebound. I remain skeptical. And therefore, I think South Africa is going to have a, quite a choppy journey back. Okay, so my last point uh, uh, to everyone on the show this morning has to do with the uh, rapid interventions across Africa by the African Development Bank. Uh, this morning, $8.9 million was approved by the board, or was announcement of approval by the board to so six countries within the SADC region. Uh, Satume and Principe get uh, a Sunday loan of about 680000 US dollars to mitigate the impact of coronavirus. So let me start with you, Uche. Now, what do you think about this uh, uh, COVID-19 impact um, uh, 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 a funding, uh, prevention, and stimulus kind of try to keep this in shape that EFDB is doing or has been doing since this uh, a pandemic started. So I, I think it is. Um, I think it's is um, an effective gesture. Um, let me put it that way. I think it's uh, all of these countries um, would need any money that they can get. As I mentioned earlier in our previous session that. Right now, we 2020 is not exactly focused on growth. It's more like mitigating risk sort of uh, um, amplification from coronavirus. We don't want things to get worse than they are, um, that currently are, or they are um, going to get. So all of this um, stimulus, both physical, monetary, or more liquidity injection, sort of try to contain the risk as it is now. And what the African Development Bank is doing is sort of using its own capacity to reach out to those countries that are sort of um, um, disadvantaged in terms of their, um, their robustness, in terms of growth, and maybe in terms of industrialization and other level or, or scope of production. So yes, I, I really welcome the idea. I think I believe that uh, if possible, they can go even more, um, depending on the coffers and how much risk they are willing to take in, in this, or during this time. I was asking, what's your, what's your thoughts on this AFDB's a stimulus package that's just been announced. And the latest one is about $8.9 million to six countries within the Southern African Development Community, the SADC. I think it's, it's positive uh, because um, we also need for the African country to be at peace. All these other countries also need support. So um, for some of them may not be able to afford um, on the back of the COVID-19 pandemic, may not be able to um, afford um, supporting their economies. So we need to have um, those economies to be supported so that overall as, um, uh, as a continent, we will be at peace and we can also grow together. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, everyone. On, on a final note, uh, Ali, give me yes. 30 seconds. Yes. So uh, just, just to reiterate, I think these smaller size, smaller ticket interventions are far more effective and uh, targeted. I like what they're doing at the African Development Bank. But I've got a bigger issue with the African Development Bank. And I think with a lot of these multilateral institutions, I really think there's got to be more introspection about the money they've been lending for these large ticket infrastructure projects, which for me are at risk of being um, way too big for the size of the economies, way too big for the forward demand structure that we're seeing. And I'm not seeing enough introspection from the leadership there saying, you know, guys, we've been hit by a circuit breaker. We need to look at what our model has been doing and whether it's effective for the time now. But these small interventions, all for it. Good, good on them. Mm. 
thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I wanted just a quick roundup of the show today in North Africa. Uh, Tunisia, one of the banks, is going to the marketplace offering some free shares, trying to raise additional money, and says it will go on the Tunisian stock exchange. That's BIAT, says his shares will be tradable on the Tunisia, uh, the Tunisian stock exchange after 178.5 million dollars in capital raising. Meantime, if, uh, Egypt's uh, uh, EFG firms declared 13.5% and 14.15 bond um, uh, dividends uh, in payment. All of this in the news as we try to wrap up the week with everyone. Thank you very much for being part of the show. Ali in Nairobi, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Ayodi Jebo at uh, Afrin Securities and Uchi Naminis at Blue FX Nigeria. Have a great weekend, everyone. Let's come back together on Monday and continue from here. I am Bussin Namafaya, and I'll see you next time.